everybody. To the session today, we'll have a lighter turnout, which is probably a good thing because we want this to be a conversation uh, where we learn about some of the work that's being done by SIC, by our partners, by our sister institute, uh, the National Democratic Institute. The site does a lot of women's programming around the world, uh, mostly focused on women's economic empowerment, women's leadership. There are a lot of organizations, a lot of NGOs, a lot of donors in Washington that work on gender-based violence, that work on women political leadership, women candidate training, women's economic empowerment, women's leadership. But all too often, we talk about these topics separately. Uh, we don't talk about them as they actually are, which are interrelated, complementary, mutually reinforcing issues. We have a fantastic panel. Two of the panelists here are site staff members. One is a site partner out of Afghanistan, uh, and Caroline Hubbard is from site's sister organization, the National Democratic Institute. And so you all get a chance to learn about what it is that we're doing in various parts of the world, what NDI is doing, and we'll have plenty of time for questions and answers from the audience so that we can learn what you are doing. Um, and we can hopefully come out of today's program with some ideas on, on programming and what could be done, and also uh, possibly some leads for partnerships amongst ourselves and various folks in the audience. And so welcome, thank you all for coming, and I hand it off to my colleague, Jenny Anderson. All right, thanks, John. Thanks, everyone, everyone very much for coming. Um, since John did that great introduction of the panelists, I'm just going to jump right into some questions. Um, so, Manisha, perhaps I will begin with you. Today, you were just back from being on Capitol Hill talking to U.S. lawmakers about the need for women, women's economic empowerment in Afghanistan and the role for women's economic empowerment in Afghanistan, especially concerning um, the Afghanistan Women's Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Um, what are the key messages that you want U.S. legislators to understand about Afghanistan? And what, what, uh, what do you feel everyone in the region should know about? Okay, um, thank you, Jenny, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Can you hear me all? Okay, I'll just put this a little bit up. Okay, can, we, can everyone hear me? Back to Zoom? Okay. Uh, yeah, so Afghanistan Women's Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Uh, we just got um, one year old. Uh, Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, our so spot. <laughs> March 12 last year when we went to our high economic council, the president of Afghanistan, the president of council, to do this um, Afghanistan motion of commerce because we existed as a, under a different name. And we, uh, but we wanted to function as, um, as chamber. And we were ready to function as chamber, but uh, we needed to justify that why we needed a separate from this chamber. And, um, and um, um, how we were, as, as an organization that we were, leading up to the advances of all of them, the reputation, how we were um, ready to get into the chamber's uh, status. And luckily we got that, and in March 12 this year, we got just one year old. Uh, and um, in one year time, uh, we've been uh, doing a lot of work. Um, with uh, policy advocacy and with um, our own uh, women business owners in Afghanistan. And so, um, so the, the message that uh, obviously I'm about to give everyone here in, in the United States uh, is that um, despite of all what's going on in Afghanistan in terms of um, war and in terms of um, political instability and uh, the, the peace process of the way on the way, uh, to uh, negotiate with the um, uh, insurgent groups, and obviously the this group, Taliban. Uh, despite of all of those that's going on in the country, uh, we are doing a lot of other work too. Uh, and our uh, people are um, really committed to improve uh, their situation, the country's situation. And we have a lot of committed uh, men and women that country uh, to improve the country's economy, the country's uh, uh, overall situation. And so, for example, uh, in the Afghanistan Chamber of Commerce, we have uh, we, uh, we established our own um, database of uh, women-owned businesses in Afghanistan. 
So I want to give a little bit of uh, some information about that so you can see what's, what's going on in Afghanistan. Unfortunately, I had a video to play uh, before I start talking today, so you, so you can really start with some positive energy and as well as a little bit of uh, MNC you can see of uh, Afghanistan when you uh, the uh, But uh, yeah. It'll be on our website, so if you want to see the AWCCI um, video, please check out our website as well as AWCCI's website. Um, but I think the numbers, I mean, I find it incredible how many women business owners are in Afghanistan that are on your register, but in your registry. Yeah, it's impressive. Uh, yeah, so there are more than 850 of them, and uh, they are um, uh, into all kinds of businesses, all sectors. Uh, so the perception earlier was that Afghan women are only in handicraft. Uh, which is which is not true. Um, if we had not collected this information, we were also in the feeling that a lot of women are in, in handicraft, maybe we, we, we would say majority of them. But with collecting data on them, uh, we found out that only half of the 850 are in handicraft. But um, the other half, or more than a little bit, the other half, are in non-traditional businesses. They're really in um, non-traditional and some male-dominant sectors uh, such as um, um, IT, uh, IT services, um, media and advertising services, uh, restaurants, uh, transportation services. Um, they're in uh, travel agencies now. They're emerging in all kinds of construction, construction services, uh, all kinds of uh, businesses that you can think of. They're in it. And in terms of uh, handicraft, they're now trying to really um, uh, get into the next level of manufacturing and, and um, packaging and really making it ready for the, for, uh, the markets and especially outside uh, Afghanistan. Uh, and, um, in the past one year, uh, with our policy advocacy, we were able to um, to get the 5% uh, uh, set-aside contracts of the government. So this was uh, on March 8, uh, 2018. 18, just uh, two weeks uh, ago, um, that after several times meeting with the National Procurement Authority in Afghanistan uh, and the support of our uh, of course, uh, First Lady's office and the President himself, uh, we were able to bring the change in the um, National Procurement Procedure. Uh, and the National Procurement Procedure now has uh, this 5% um, preference um, for uh, women-owned businesses in Afghanistan. And so we are in the stage now to work with our women-owned businesses to really train them and uh, make them ready to use that uh, quota that we have now of that 5% of contracts uh, from the government. And it's not only in the central level, but it's also in the local level, and the circle was uh, sent out um, marking the international women's day in Afghanistan. Well, yeah, no, it's a huge accomplishment that the AWCCI has only been in existence for a little over a year, and you've already had a major policy win concerning uh, the role of women's businesses in Afghanistan. Yeah, procurement is huge in Afghanistan, so this is a big thing for women business owners in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and the AWCCI, you've also been in the process of establishing chapters within the four major provinces as well. So connecting that center to the subnational governance level is hugely important for women's economic empowerment in the country to make sure that the center is speaking with the provinces and the provinces are speaking amongst each other concerning women's policy um, steps forward. Yes, uh, so in terms of uh, opening our offices or the our official launches and all the other four uh, major provinces, which are centers of four zones, east, west, north, and uh, south, um, um, we uh, we want to make sure uh, that um, our uh, board, uh, board members of the zone offices they get into they get into the uh, provincial uh, policy making committees uh, because in Kabul we have a seat at our, our high economic council uh, and we have a seat at our uh, high um, council of urban development where. In both of these uh, high, -long, uh, high -long council and high council of um, uh, urban development, they discuss a lot of 
economic uh, development uh, projects, uh, economic development um, policies and issues. And both of the meetings are uh, chaired by the President himself. And so on, sometimes on weekend visits and sometimes on um, uh, every other week, uh, every two weeks, uh, meetings takes place. Uh, but then, of course, at the provincial level, there are the economic uh, development committees at the provincial, the province level. And so when we did our um, launches in all these uh, four, uh, four center of the zones, we involved the governors in the launch of the, in the launch events, and we made them to do the launch, and we made them to to give us some uh, promises, such as like the governors did on giving a seat to our board members to the uh, economic uh, development committees in the province level. Holding them to account for those promises in the next step. <laughs> yes, yes, um, and yeah. So to transfer how we work in the central level, to transfer that into the provinces, and ask our board members uh, to to be active and involved <coughs> in the province level issues um, would help us to raise all the um, uh, challenges that the moment this is uh, face, um, and also get support and get uh, our our uh, recommendations into uh, those kind of uh, yeah, decision making tables. Uh, maybe we'll just Larry and then talk to Nick uh, next. Um, you've been working very hard on establishing a women's business resource center at Papua New Guinea. First, maybe how, how has that process been? How's it going? And also, why was it important to establish a women specific business resource center as opposed to just? Just a business resource. Um, thanks, Jim. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time to come have a listen as well. Um, so, in in relation to how hard has it been, there's been lots of barriers. <laughs> how long is a piece of string? <laughs> so, you know, all sorts of barriers: financial barriers, geographical barriers, uh, anything that comes with starting a new business, whether it's not for profit or not. Um, also, with the fact that we have skeleton staff, nobody knows who Site was. Now they do. Um, <laughs> And uh, yeah, so, so I can get into that in a moment, but in, in terms of why we had to establish a women's business resource centre, um, you know, a little bit of background on PNG. Uh, it's somewhere in the vicinity of 98% gender-based violence. So, you know, that's almost every single female in the country has experienced some form of gender-based violence. Um, not only with that, just safety in general, put aside the gender-based violence, safety in general for women and for everybody moving around is difficult. Women, um, you know, in terms of establishing resources, networks, skill levels, access to, you know, finance, access to meeting like peers in the same industry that they might have an interest in starting a business is difficult because they have caring responsibilities. There's no social security set up. Our literacy levels are, you know, over 50, lower literacy levels are over 50%. So it paints quite a dark picture, obviously. It's improved significantly over the last 10 years. But in terms of you know the basic ability for people to network, you know, men can uh, uh, attend an afternoon at golf or um, you know, attend something where, yeah, just just the basics of, of women being able to access this sort of um, available resource, it doesn't exist. So women, this this is the first of its kind, not just in Papua New Guinea, but in, in in the Pacific region. So where women, budding entrepreneurs or existing entrepreneurs, business owners those who might be community leaders, whether it's faith-based community leaders or just in their rural community. Um, we have a high percentage of squad settlements that have their own leaders, you know, event leaders. Then come in and look at accessing, you know, courses, um, training, uh, as I said, networking, ideation in business. So it's always been a need. It's always been a how do we, how do we, how do we get there because we have to put consideration into uh, the location, where is, where, is, where is it going to be established, um, in terms of, as I said, safety, um, public bus routes, being accessible not just to those who are urban um, situated, but those who are living you know, in rural areas. So, um, it, yeah, it's not even just a luxury, it's a, it's a necessity and across the country, so this is the first of its kind. Um, but we've overcome a lot of the barriers that we first had when we, when we first looked at the concept of, of starting the Women's Business Centre, and uh, you know, we, we've also just celebrated our first year uh, in November. We had our first birthday, um, which was very exciting, and um, 
you know, the statistics are, are pleasing that we've had as a result of this for that short amount of time. <laughs> Massive challenges. Indeed, yeah. <laughs> about the links between economic empowerment and women's political empowerment, which NDI focuses a lot on political empowerment, but we're also looking at always sort of, you know, does economic empowerment lead to political empowerment or vice versa? So our, our Not the Cost program is uh, focused on violence that targets politically active women, specifically because they are women. And in probably the last two years, since 2016, when we launched a call to action in New York City um, on the sidelines of the Commission on the Status of Women, on the issue, there has been increased visibility of this type of violence targeting women. Um, I think partially because it um, happens quite a bit online, and a lot of us are able to see what's happening in other countries here in the United States, online threats, um, sexual harassment, and so forth. Um, it also is reflected in the Me Too campaign and what is happening in, US, in the US legislature, what came out of the California legislature. So it's really physical, sexual, um, psychological, both online and offline violence that is used against women by <coughs> people in their family or by people in their own political party or by members of the security force and so forth, really to manipulate their ability to participate in politics or to stop them. Um, so it's, it's very much a backlash on women stepping forward and countering normal uh, gender norms and social norms. Um, and to that extent, I think it's important to keep in mind in terms of women's economic empowerment as well, because what, what I think it indicates is that in order to really create extreme, real change, we can't just have political empowerment of women, we can't just have economic empowerment of women, because you have to really go about um, breaking down patriarchal norms and structures that give men more power, and, and, and ask questions about what are the drivers for men wanting to share power in politics or share power in business. Um, and when we think about men and political power, we're talking about men at a very high economic scale and also uh, having a very high amount of power. So the same drivers for men to give power up maybe inside the home or inside the community don't necessarily work at that level because there is not necessarily anything for them to gain from sharing power. So how do we convince men to create more gender equality in politics? Because what we see instead is men really trying to hold on and power being used excuse me, violence being used as a tool to maintain uh, that status quo. Uh, so for example, Latin America and the Caribbean, where we've seen um, a, a great you know, uptick in gender quotas and number of women at the national level, we also have some of the highest levels of intimate partner violence and violence against women <coughs> politics in the world. And so there has, is necessarily a correlation with women being able to get into elected office and women actually sharing power and um, being equitable with men. I'm sure you're finding the incentives to bring them to the share of power is very uh, country specific or community specific. Are there is there anything you can share with us about how you, you develop those or how you identify the incentives to bring them to the table to start power sharing? Because no one wants to share power. All right. <laughs> I mean, we're learning a lot of lessons because for a long time we thought, okay, if we told men that were like heads of political parties that if they brought women to the table in the party, for example, that they would be a more electorally um, attractive, right? If your party reflects citizens, um, women are 50% or more of the population, then you could win elections potentially. What we're finding is that tactical choices to include women, again, do not correlate with actual changes in levels of violence towards women or gender equality uh, or well-being of women. So getting men to make that tactical choice, let's say to pass a gender quota, for example, Kenya is a really good example because in 2010 they passed a gender quota in the Constitution. It was supposed to be implemented in 2012. They managed to avoid its full implementation. And as they're sort of negotiating with this gender quota, the men are coming together across the political parties, which, if anybody knows Kenyan politics, are very divided. 
but the men are able to come together on the one piece, which is to keep the women out. And so instead of power sharing, which is what the quota really asks for, they created additional seats so they could actually still give the women some seats without sharing any of their power. And so that reflects a very much a tactical choice in terms of why there was even support for the gender quota in the Constitution. And the women in the women's movement are saying, oh, we are so tired. We thought, we, we literally are saying, we thought we were done. We worked so long. Here we are, we have this quota, and we're still fighting, actually, to have any power. And the violence is very high there against women in politics. I think you make a step forward, and then it's going to be another spoken effort. Here's a step back. Why did you feel, I mean, uh, establishing the Afghanistan Women's Chamber of Commerce and Industry it was a very long struggle to get the government on board to establish as well. There were, you know, others in sort of the mainstream business association and chamber world that weren't so keen to have a women's only chamber established. Um, maybe you could tell us a little more about getting to that process as well as why you felt it was important for Afghanistan to have a women's only chamber, as well as your experience on getting male allies and bringing them to the table and maybe some lessons you've learned or best practices you've learned from this process. It's a big question, sorry. <laughs> yes, um, let's see. We haven't really made any um, accepted president or the CEO maybe any other male ally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one, that's <laughs> Yes, we got one, okay. Um, so, yeah, uh, it took us a long time. So when we started our own uh, uh, um, business association and we did a name at 2014 uh, with chamber because we didn't have that political support uh, those years. Um, so um, we had to name it differently, meaning not from the start by the development. Uh, and do our own old advocacy work, uh, but then uh, all the way from 2014 to 2017, when we really saw that there was an opportunity that we can go in, and I was through the first lady's office, into to the first lady's office, and into to the president himself. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is how we made our way uh, to, um, to to get our name changed to the Afghanistan Chamber of Commerce. And uh, why we needed to have a separate women's chamber because uh, Afghan um, business women, um, they face uh, all a different set of challenges and uh, issues and uh, barriers to towards their business development and uh, its expansion and accessing markets and all other issues uh, than, than that, of, uh, that, that of the men. Uh, so we had other um, uh, organizations such as Afghanistan, the Chamber of Commerce and Industry, they were okay, good. We were working together. We had <coughs> um, uh, all the time, like a good, pretty good relationship in terms of, uh, including um, as in some of the events or, or conferences and so on. Um, but then uh, we weren't able really to to use that platform to raise our our issues. Mm -hmm really uh, focus uh, on our issues, on, on specific women-owned businesses issues. Um, and so we needed that. We needed to have an organization led by ourselves, led by women. And so we were the decision makers and we were the ones that would uh, lead the way, not that we, we use other uh, platform, right? Uh, there are other people who are in the they leave and we have, we have to go through a lot of uh, bureaucracy of uh, getting approvals and um, and so on. Uh, so that, that was uh, one reason. And the other one that um, we wanted to get connected to the world. Uh, and uh, we started as a, a different name, even on the podcast as well, the short form is me. As me, uh, we, we got into a lot of um, regional and international conferences and international, regional and international uh, platforms where we made our introduction and we tried to promote uh, lead as um, 
as the uh, as main organization that represents uh, women in businesses in Afghanistan, and, uh, and so we should be we should be approached for uh, for getting them connected to women owned businesses in Afghanistan, or getting connected our women owned businesses to various opportunities outside, especially outside Afghanistan, at the regional level and the national level. But um, we didn't see that happen. Uh, just not having this, this panel, the chamber, it was not happening. Yes, though we did good at the time, good outreach and good, uh, made good connections. But again, whenever there was uh, any conference, exhibition, uh, business matching came, uh, they would go to the Afghan Station of Commerce or Industries, and sometimes they would call us and ask us to introduce women. Sometimes they were not, and they would, they would introduce women to those uh, programs, and they may not have been the right people. Yeah, there were times that they were not the right people to go to those kind of places and make a good use of it and come back and get, remain in touch with all of the women and transfer what they learn or what, the, what were the opportunities to all other women and to a bigger group. Um, so that made us that we really needed this style of change. And then, uh, yeah, through the process, uh, we had this direct connection to the president, and the president, um, Dr. Shafani, is very supportive of uh, women's uh, empowerment, uh, and especially women's economic empowerment, because he believes that economic empowerment um, gives us the power of decision making and making choices and you know, negotiating. Uh, power within the family and within the society. Um, so, um, and I'll tell you what, what else he has done in terms of women's economic empowerment. So it was not only that he supported uh, the, the women's chamber to, to be established, we were established to, 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 to come into existence, uh, but a whole um, national priority program uh, for women's economic empowerment. He launched it last year. And then uh, we had another uh, national program called uh, National Solidarity uh, Program, NSP. We changed the name of the program to Citizen Charter. And, and, and in that program, earlier the, the quota for, for women uh, was, uh, it was a little bit more than 20%. But then when this president came, and we changed this program's name, it's a program work with the rural areas for the rural areas development, uh, we changed that quota to 50 percent Except it cannot be. So the rural areas and all the uh, rural level councils, <coughs> rural, um, uh, the, the district level councils, the village level councils, it has to be 50-50. Women and men, uh, they should uh, decide together on their development projects. Uh, yes, it cannot be 20 percent or 80% of the year 70, it has to be 50%. So this is what they, uh, he did also. And then um, uh, we had to go to some of the ministers, of course, who were uh, part of the High Economic Council uh, in Afghanistan, Minister of Commerce, Minister of uh, Finance, and uh, uh, some others uh, who were also men. And, um, and we, we talked to them and we tried for the High Point Council meeting when we had to present our, our case. So we met all these uh, main ministers and tried to convince them that we really need to have a separate in this chamber. And um, yeah, and this is how we, uh, when we went to the main meeting and got our presentation. The uh, majority were aware of this issue and the majority were convinced beforehand that yeah, there is a need for uh, the existence of a gas and shepherd commerce. And this is how they support it. And the whole council made the decision that yeah. it should exist. If you have a champion in a very high high position of power <laughs> to help facilitate this. Yeah. yeah, maybe this was the this is the best lesson you have done. Have, have, have the president on your side. To you have to have the president on your side in countries maybe like Afghanistan or maybe anywhere in the world. Uh, to help you get, <laughs> get things done. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Maybe turn back to um, uh, just looking at gender, 
gender-based violence to the more in economic development or economic empowerment. Um, Ellie, you mentioned um, just the staggering, terrible statistics in the Papua New Guinea of um, gender-based violence. Mm -hmm. From your perspective, I mean, with the Resource Center as well as just your own personal experience in, in life, um, how do you see women's economic empowerment and just, like reducing gender-based violence or it does it. Like, what are you finding when women are more economically empowered? In terms of reducing gender-based violence today, I think that's a bit ambitious. But in terms of economically empowering women <coughs> today to then make them politically empowered, so they become policy change makers, they become better advocates for their groups. Um, women should not be a minority group. They're 50% or more of the population. <coughs> with us in Papua New Guinea, our small to medium enterprise represents 80% of the market. Over 50% of that is, is women. Um, and so, you know, in terms of the work we're doing, establishing the Resource Centre, we have an advocacy program, program, we have other programs that are, you know, working through our tertiary institutions for those who are of the high literacy level. It's all about improving the PNG economy by supporting women in commerce. And so, you know, Talking about the gender-based violence, that's such a huge initiative to try and reduce, but if you are economically empowering women across a whole wide range of things, you know, what uh, my two colleagues here were suggesting about making them better decision makers, it creates opportunities to be, you know, to, to recognise leadership, and then of course, as I said, becoming more politically empowered. Papua New Guinea is one of only three countries on the globe that has no women in parliament. Um, so, you know, once they become policy makers, then you have a direct impact into making sure you're I mean, again, you're going for law and justice and the support, associated supports that come with that. But that's how you're going to try and reduce it. Um, there's, the, there's a direct link. You can't have one without the other. Are you seeing, and this is a larger question, we can talk about it, but are you seeing women, through your center or your own experience, women who are becoming more economically empowered? Seeing sort of a leadership role for themselves within within their community, within the political sphere. Do you see that connection coming naturally, or should it be more facilitated and helped along? I think it's a bit of both. You often you often have natural natural born leaders. As I said, there's different communities, whether it's in the family community, um, if it's in the faith based community, in the business space. But absolutely, if you some people don't realise they can be leaders, some people don't realise they can be, you know, powerful advocates. Um, one of our programs that we run out of the centre is policy advocacy, teaching women how to be better advocates, how to recognise what um, government policies represent them, and if they're not being appropriately addressed as women in the business space. So being able to break down a policy and see where they can make the changes and where they can make reforms and it's not just left to people that work in government. So, you know, teaching them how to offer these reforms. So, in terms of, am I, are we seeing that? Yes, you, you, there is, um, again, through empowering women, you do uh, have opportunities to recognise that I'm understanding this, I can actually be a spokesperson. I have women that come in that, uh, there's one particular lady just two weeks ago, can't read or write. Um, has a small business, a, a marketplace business that she runs outside the front of her house. But she's the spokesperson for um, the Susu Mamas group, which is like the kind of breastfeeding and um, you know, postpartum care and so on for women. But she also gets a lot of information for different skills training that might be available for free. Um, all these women are what we call functional literate, so they've only made it to maybe grade three level, uh, so we're like seven or eight years old. But she's a leader. She comes in. Um, asked me all the questions, spent four hours with me, popped in to say, oh, I just needed to know where you were and what you offered. Can't speak English, so I was speaking and pitching with her, going through all the force and so on, and thought, how on earth am I going to get these women that can't read or write, can't speak English? Um, she brought 15 women the following week. Wow. So she's a leader in her own space, but doesn't even realise it. They're just kind of like accidental leaders that, you know, yeah. organically become the spokespeople for their particular community. Mm. Um, but as I said, the changes are going to come if you are giving them that <coughs> You know, confidence and empowerment and so on to make the financial decisions, make business decisions about how they're going to support their family. We're not talking, you know, million dollar businesses, 
But surprisingly, some of these people in the you know that are having like what we call table markets at home yeah. are supporting families of six and seven kids. So you know, yeah, yeah some of them are the main breadwinners. That answer your question. Yeah, <laughs> wonderful. Yeah, no, I think what you're saying about breaking down the policy. I mean, when, I think for anyone, you hear policy, it's like ah, I don't really know what that means or what that is. But giving people the language mm -hmm. and this, just like some of the terminology, mm -hmm. it's a different language. Even in English. <laughs> but if I could just also add to that, some of our outreach programs we've had around, because there's three separate areas of the Women's Business Resource Centre and directions the, the actual um, sessions and training and skills development, some that we offer out of the centre. We have the tertiary program that looks at um, building upon existing tertiary curriculum throughout the country. And then we have policy advocacy. In this particular stream that we've been um, Incorporating, you know, different outreach programs to teach women how to, you know, what is an advocate? What, you know, right. how do you become an advocate? And we've been focusing on a couple of, uh, on two specific policies that were released by the part by the government uh, in the last 18 months. We encourage the women to bring a brother, a husband, a father. So that's been very um, exciting and encouraging to see the men in our community because it's all part of that culture change. You know, moving away from the patriarchal society and uh, being able to recognise that. You know, I always say, you know, you're going to build a stronger family by building up your women, you build a better economy, better energy, all that sort of thing. Um, so that's been really encouraging to see that mm -hmm. they're, they're dragging their men along in there. You know, it's funny that it's, it's, it's going to, you know, um, advantage everybody. Yeah. That sounds like an amazing program. <laughs> Pretty good, yeah. yeah. One, I think one year we've had a thousand women. We've had a thousand women through our doors. Um, yeah, it's, it, it's very exciting. And, you know, we were talking about um, these outreach and so on, an exciting, you know, milestone today. We have a Facebook page we started about six, eight months ago, and we were getting like 30 likes, 50 likes. Um, a couple of months ago, I asked John for the, you know, site credit card, said, can we boost some of these things? And, you know, <laughs> got up to a couple of hundred likes. And then, yeah, this morning at 3 a.m., came across my email 1.6. Uh, 1600 likes. Wow, everyone um, liked their page. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that page, yeah. <laughs> very exciting for us, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, oh, yeah, it's, it's very exciting. It is. Yeah. have a bunch more likes after this. <laughs> <laughs> Please. <laughs> to go back to Caroline, linking up on what Ellie was just talking about, um, SIPE and NBI have a joint program that links women's economic empowerment to political empowerment. And I was just wondering, like, <clears throat> what have you? Learned. I, I, mean, I heard you mentioning that there's not a lot of data or research out there looking at this. Mm -hmm. How, how's your, how's our program going, and what have you learned, and what are you looking forward to? I guess? Sure. Yeah. So the program we're working on, because we are very interested um, in trying to understand the link between economic empowerment and political empowerment, and vice versa. And it's assumed in a, in a lot of circles that there is proof that there's a direct correlation between women's economic empowerment and empowerment of women overall. And we question that because it's not really what we're seeing. So through the program that we're doing with SIPE, we're trying to work with women in business associations, both um, mixed-sex business associations as well as single-sex women-only business associations. And we've modified an assessment tool that we use for political parties, where we analyze the organizational structure, the rules, and the culture of the party to understand how women are or are not progressing, what opportunities or barriers they face. So we modified that tool with site to use inside business associations. And we have completed those assessments. And it helps us identify whether there are written rules, informal or formal rules, um, that are basically keeping women out, even though potentially they're being seen as gender blind roles, but maybe it's around what time the meetings take place. You know, if the meetings take place after six o'clock, women oftentimes can't come or it's unsafe and so forth. Um, and then from that, what we want to do is help the women in the business associations identify potentially not only what changes and what mechanisms inside the business associations could facilitate increased um, power and leadership by women, but also what could be done at the national level in terms of legislative changes. So both organizational change, but also um, national and legal framework change to better support women in business. Um, the question that sort of still rests with us is uh, along the lines of if men in business associations are leaping into politics and going back and forth and sort of there's that fluidity between political power and economic power, do we see the same thing with women? And anecdotally, so far in the project, we don't see the same thing. 
with women. Um, you might have you know, very strong, uh, very successful women business leaders, and there is not a fluid movement between um, business leaders or heads of associations and politics. And so we're interested in better understanding that, and, and through building the capacity of women in the business associations to not only identify what's keeping them potentially out of leadership or, or at a lower level economically uh, than their male counterparts, but also potentially, but what would be the pathway? You know, if you were to make a leap as a woman from being a business leader to politics, what are the barriers that are keeping you out? What are the opportunities? Um, some of the strategies that NDI uses to support women in other sectors other than politics at a very grassroots uh, level, be it women in business or women entrepreneurs or it might be women service delivery uh, providers, is bringing them together and trying to do the sort of training, the capacity and confidence, um, the skills piece, uh, but also civic education. We find that a lot of women who have not been in politics don't know that they may already be being political and that they definitely have leadership skills. Um, but oftentimes women will see maybe business is okay, you know, service delivery, civil society is okay, but politics are corrupt. Politics are for the men, politics are dangerous, politics are violent, and they don't really see politics doing anything for women, oftentimes because the parties do not have platforms for women. So they're not seen as being reflected in politics. So it's that civic education and sensitization piece has to happen a lot of times with women to get them to enter in and to really see the value. Because again, there's a risk, right? Why would you step out and start trying to participate either at a local level or a national level if it means not only violence, but potentially your family doesn't want to talk to you anymore? Or an, an example from Tanzania in the last election where more than 50 women were divorced for voting in the wrong way, uh, these would be their, their husband's preference, right? So that has real economic and real life implications. So taking into consideration you know, the value in stepping out and, and, and the, um, the backlash that can happen. But the other um, thing that's really important is coalitions and women's movements. And uh, we're really focused on bringing women together across sectors. And so when we are trying to reach out and work with women in the economic sector, it's about bringing them into work that's being done across all sectors. Um, the more women, the different regions, the different um, roles they play in society that can come together on some common agenda, the stronger that movement is. And obviously bringing women entrepreneurs together with women that are already in elected office. Because a lot of times women in elected office um, they will come, it, it, it is not necessarily true that women come through local office. I mean, we, we all talk about the pipeline, but um, there really isn't necessarily a pipeline. So a lot of times women in national office haven't necessarily come through local level. Maybe they were, maybe they weren't a part of the women's movement. So they actually need help setting the agenda. And so trying to bring women in parliament together with women in civil society, um, women business owners, to help, help set the agenda so that women that are in elected office know the types of laws and policies that women in business need. Uh, and I'm assuming in Afghanistan, maybe some of this is done too, because there is there are women in parliament there, and so there, there are political women to come together with, whereas opposed to in PNG, where there aren't necessarily any women in elected office, are there women of political parties that we can form coalitions with or network with, and so forth. Um, those are some of the strategies that we use. Yeah. Do you have anything to add to that, like talking about working with parliament parties? Getting to get these policies. I mean, you mentioned that you have people in the center as well as people in the provinces talking about policy issues and raising these. Um, I don't know, is there anything else you want to add about working with parliamentarians and sort of sensitizing them to women's economic or just women's issues in general? Women's issues in, gen in general. Um, I used to be on the board of. Um, Another organization, Afghan Women's Network, again, that's a 2.2 years old um, advocacy platform. So, for all kinds of uh, other laws other than economic uh, related laws and policies. Um, yeah, we used to work a lot with the women parliamentarians um, to really um, educate them and to, uh, to, um, to sensitize them. Why it's important. For example, we had uh, a law uh, passed in 2009 on um, elimination of violence against women. Uh, so, our EVA law um, was passed through a, a president's decree, and usually, when the president's, to a president's decree about the law is passed, um, especially when the parliament is uh, on leave, then when they come back, uh, the law has to go to, through the parliament. 
but then um, for a while this law didn't go to parliament, but then in 2013, uh, one of the parliamentarians won wanted to bring the law to the parliament's agenda. And so then we had to do a lot of lobbying with, um, with women, of course, uh, first, but then uh, with a lot of um, male parliamentarians too. Not to first bring it to the agenda, but then if, if they had to bring it to the agenda of the parliament to discuss this law, then um, they had to really pass it as, it, as it, the law was written and was passed in 2009. Um, so yeah, uh, there is there's a lot of need to work with the parliamentarians. Mm -hmm. Except yeah. now that we have a special case that we are in the economic council, uh, which is the highest decision making. Uh, of course, I mean, a lot of laws and policies and um, programs that we discuss at the economic council uh, meetings uh, chaired by the president, they go to, to the parliament too. But then the highest decision making uh, platform is this economic council meeting, and we are there. So, <laughs> so a little bit, yeah, they uh, <laughs> we have luxury of not approaching a lot of people. I'm just going to ask one, round of, one more round of questions, and then we'll open it up to everyone to ask questions. Um, but I wanted to ask something about um, digital economy and e-commerce. Um, start with you, Ali. Um, working with the, um, like maybe talk, like you have the Business Resource Center. What's the correlation with the digital economy? Like how are you, you know, what, I've heard you mention it, but I'd love to hear more about it. Um, look, in the most simple terms, in, in, in Papua New Guinea, last stats, I don't know how old they are, but our cost of rental space alone is akin to Manhattan. Wow. So it's really? disgusting. And no, we don't have a lovely, you know, waterfront. So it's pretty high. Yeah. Our, our internet costs are the most expensive in the world huh. on the planet. So um, digital economy, economy is such a good avenue for all of our, you know, SME um, entrepreneurs because of the fact that just the sheer cost of actually having a retail space, regardless of whether it's a goods and service or an actual tangible product. Um, you know, funnily enough, so we, we spend a lot of time partnering with different uh, establishments to teach. Um, you know, at the moment we're, we're really pushing to, you know, get people to recognise whether their product is export ready. And, you know, if they're going to do it, how are they going to do it? Because essentially, you know, Papua New Guineans don't uh, have the sort of income that allows them to go and do buying trips around the world, you know, and, you know, because it is an informal sector, that obviously gives an indication that they don't even have the funds sometimes to formalise their business, to, to meet the requirements of the tax office and so on. So, utilising social media, utilising networking skills through the, di the digital economy, I can't seem to get my mouth around the word economy today, <laughs> um, not enough coffee. But, yeah, so we, we have spent a lot of time and efforts in, um, you know, you, you mentioned uh, matchmaking with businesses and so on, and doing that via, you know, uh, via the digital economy, at home. and also looking at people to see how they package their business to find, you know, see if they're investment ready to, to look at finding others that are going to provide venture capital because accessing finance is so difficult, if not impossible. I don't think at this stage for our <coughs> entrepreneurs, it's it's, it's uh, things like getting equity assets, credit rating, that sort of thing, it's just a lot of So uh, being able to access the global market, that's the only way they're going to do it. So we spend a lot of time and effort in educating people as to how powerful it can be uh, to grow their business and uh, and also you know improve their own skill level. That's how they access a lot of their skills training. They can't actually show up at our centre. We're in the process of adapting some of our um, facilities so they can come in and have some online learning by the centre. Uh, this will be the way that we um, continue to expand our services outside the centre between now and when we can replicate the centre across the country. Uh, you know, if we're doing, which has been something that's actually been asked, we're, we'd love to do it, but we're getting requested to do that. Um, Papua New Guinea is so geographically compromised that you can't access it by car or by public plane, that's it, out of the main um, city centre. So, um, you know, digital economy is the, is the way that yeah. Yeah, the only direction that they can go at this point. Right. Yeah. yeah, and I'm sure that, I mean, I would think that also involves policy issues as well as like a whole host of, you know, 
slowly, slowly have to slowly, slowly, but achievable. Yeah, absolutely, and um, and achievable in a very short space of time for you know, a small amount of, of uh, financial input. Make a lot of changes. Yeah, absolutely. Anisha, how about in Afghanistan, like the use of technology to help level the playing field um, for women in business? Is it, um, are you seeing gains? Or even in the advocacy space, how are you seeing technology play out, even you know, at whatever level in Afghanistan? Uh, in Afghanistan, too, um, technology is getting, the use of technology is getting popular. Uh, though our internet cost is also very high. Uh, but um, yeah, the good thing is that a lot of things are now, a lot of initiatives are taken to really uh, decrease the internet cost. Um, but uh, overall, I mean, uh, for, uh, for women owned businesses in Afghanistan, um, the using online um, sales and online platforms is one of the major um, sources of uh, getting sales. Um, so, um, but we, we have another issue with that. Uh, we, our um, e-commerce gateway, which is like online payments and all that, that's not activated yet. Yeah, right. <laughs> and so being, again, on the High Economic Council meetings, there were several times that um, this issue came up and I stressed on that President and to the Minister of Telecommunication and to the um, to our central bank, to the chair of the central bank, that we really need this as right. soon as possible because uh, we really want to work with our own businesses to set them up on, on online sales and, and things like that. And there was a training on way um, on digital um, marketing and digital sales, hmm. um, which will take place outside of Afghanistan. For about uh, for around 20 uh, for businesses, and we do a lot of our own uh, work to our uh, social media, especially Facebook. Facebook is very it has good use in, in Afghanistan, so we do a lot of our um, like um, news spreading news or a lot of you know getting support or um, uh, doing a lot of campaigns. We do that through um, Facebook. I mean the Facebook. We have a Facebook page, we have a YouTube channel, we have a, we have a Twitter, <laughs> and it's called Afghanistan Women Chamber of Commerce and Industry, EWCCI. And then if you go to all of them, you will get a lot of good stories, and if you look on YouTube channel, a lot of good videos. Excellent. We're all going to go look at it right after this event. Carolyn, do you have any, I mean, I know NDI works on sort of analytics and looking at Twitter feed and things like that, as well as perhaps uh, building coalitions and conventions. Is there anything regarding digital space or sure. Well, I mean, similar to the financial sector, in the democracy sector, it was initially seen as sort of the great leveler of the playing field. Um, following the Arab Spring, it was sort of viewed as, this is fantastic, right? Citizens can come out, they can voice their opinions freely, they have the freedom to uh, come together for advocacy initiatives and so forth. But in the sort of ensuing years, what we've realized is that it doesn't actually necessarily create um, or transform equality. It oftentimes is actually replicating existing inequalities or um, strengthening them. Right. So uh, in terms of um, technology and how men and women are using it in politics, um, coming back to violence, women are exponentially more likely to experience um, horrific online harassment um, that can also lead to physical violence just for being women online expressing their viewpoint. Um, so as part of our Not the Cost initiative, we have been collecting testimonies from members of parliament, local office, women mayors, and across the board, across the globe, they all experience really high levels of online harassment and online violence. Um, there is a study that came out recently in the UK that showed that uh, women um, and women of color are 30% more, they're, they're receiving 30% more of the online harassment that's coming into the parliament overall. So there's a, there's a big difference. And so in our minds, um, the platforms themselves, Facebook, Twitter, um, 
uh, other platforms too, sort of WhatsApp and so forth, uh, none of the platforms are interested in changing their rules or their processes or addressing these issues in sort of a systemic way. Uh, they treat it as an individual violation. So if a woman reports something, then they might take it down. But there is no sort of cross sort of systemic rule that forces them to recognize a, that it's online harassment and that it is, should be something that is akin to hate speech and so forth and should be taken down. So there's no way really to filter, remove, and so forth. So that's one area that we're, we're working to figure out, you know, what's the advocacy that needs to be done in order to force um, platforms to actually acknowledge that this shouldn't be okay, that this is not freedom of speech, that actually is reducing the democratic space and the freedom of all citizens to speak because what we know anecdotally is that young women um, or people that are maybe thinking about entering into politics or have just entered into politics or are from a marginalized population and don't have a lot of support will opt out once they start doing it. It's not, we even know this from the 2016 elections, um, ask your friend, you know, if you were on Facebook and you were talking about Hillary Clinton versus, you know, the other candidates, how many of us sort of just said, never mind, it's really not worth it for me, for me to be online. And this is happening to women at all levels of politics. Um, so the other thing that we're thinking about is how do you prepare women to be online and to be safe? And there are, are increasingly, um, there's an organization called Heartthrob, um, and there's another organization, I think it's called Community Red. Um, these are US-based, but there are increasingly initiatives in the online space thinking about how, how women should protect themselves and where the steps you should take. The challenge, I think, is that Silicon Valley is still majority men. It's male-led, it's male engineers. So there is, um, it's not just about the individuals that are coming onto the platforms and speaking against uh, women in politics and so forth, it's how the platforms are actually created and the algorithms. Um, when you sort of put in your search, um, at, in, if you go to Google and you put in a search, there are sort of predetermined searches that will come up for you. And um, I can't remember some of them, but if you sort of put in women are and see what comes up, it's not the most positive, <laughs> not the most positive thing. So there's lots of different areas um, that where work really needs to be done. Um, and so we're sort of coming into that and thinking about in the democratic space, what does that mean and how do we help women um, protect themselves? No, that's, yeah, that's a very good point. Just personally, I've been surprised that like LinkedIn is one of those that you know, have your picture and your name and all this. Like, isn't this re-entrenching when I mean, you have women and uh, just that's a good point. Yeah. Why don't we why aren't <laughs> we acknowledging those? Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, okay, so um, now it's time, this is supposed to be more participatory, so we would love to have questions. I think there might be a microphone coming around, perhaps, or maybe not. Oh, yes, there's a microphone, so, Ali, I'll start with you. Thank you for the very interesting discussion today. Um, I, uh, I want to follow on some of the uh, discussion points that uh, Caroline, you brought in. Uh, speaking about backlash against women that are entering into politics, women that want to uh, you know, develop their leadership uh, uh, potential, um, how about women that are you know, becoming economically empowered, women that are taking it to the next level, um, you know, through the support of the, let's say, Afghanistan Women's Chamber of Commerce or LA, uh, through the Women's Resource Center. Are you seeing any backlash against these women that are sort of becoming more and more successful? And if you do, what are your thoughts about how to overcome uh, this backlash? Thank you. Um, well, I know, yeah, look, I, I know that that is uh, a concern, just listening to Caroline talk about all the platforms, that, that is often a concern because we've got so many different public body groups. Um, at the moment, there's no regulatory you know, measures in place to protect women. I do know that does uh, disenfranchise women from getting involved. And so what's happening at the moment is there's, there's been a big push to have training and you know, forums around, do you think that you're going to be you know, interested in being a political leader? But there hasn't been enough about, well, what's the government going to do about protecting you? So that has been raised again in our law and justice sector. There has, we have had the uh, focus groups that have come in particularly around the outreach that we've had around the advocacy paper because we are encouraging as many women to, um, you know, give their opinions and their suggestions and be part of this draft policy, but they're concerned as well about showing up on the day. They want to put their name, but am I going to be anonymous? Um, so in answer to your question, there is, it's still a work in progress. Um, all we can say is that, you know, yes, we leave it as anonymity and um, 
we, we look at, I guess, safety in numbers. So it's a matter of if there is going to be any sort of public forums. Uh, it's not just the Women's Business Centre, a bit, Women's Business Resource Centre, but there's, you know, a combination of a couple of different women's groups, some higher echelon women, some of the lower, you know, socioeconomic representatives. There's no firm answer to say, yes, it's in place. We already have issues with our own personal safety in Papua New Guinea. So I know the government is not at the point where they're going to say, well, we're going to put some money into helping protect our women who want to speak up. They encourage it, they talk about it, and they always suggest, yes, absolutely, come to the forefront and say something, but yes, there's no protective measures in place. Essentially, with those sorts of stats of 98%, there's a good, that's a good indication that most of these men that are in these positions are also perpetrators. So, um, so, you know, um, it's a work in progress, but it is definitely a very hot topic of conversation. It is more and more openly discussed. Um, the sheer stats are more and more openly discussed than what they were, as I said, even a decade ago. So whilst myself and whoever else might be, you know, spokespeople for what's going on in PNG present a very dire outlook on it, it is certainly improved from what it was. 10 years ago, so we're getting there. I just don't know whether it will be there by the time my daughter's at the age to run for politics. So, mm -hmm. anyone else want to address Caroline? Okay, now, Kim, this time, uh, since this whole thing has been happening, okay, um, what um, the past kind of five years, uh, we have started using that, but of course, um, there's recently a uh, uh, cyber security uh, law. Uh, the draft is there and they're discussing it and our um, uh, women's groups, especially from the Afghan Women's Network and the VN, they're trying to uh, get into that and see how uh, women's protection is uh, considered in that law, uh, which needs, of course, very special, very special provisions um, in the law. Um, uh, but other than that, uh, a lot of um, uh, personal um, contacts to uh, to various departments uh, like the security police or uh, the communication ministry uh, to to <coughs> put down something that's uh, really um, harassing posts, for example, on Facebook, especially, or someone has made a fake uh, Facebook page on on, the, on your name yeah. and has uploaded some pictures that uh, has that he or she might have um, got access to. Uh, so really, uh, it's, uh, if you have only good personal connections with those kind of places, then you are able to put that down. Otherwise, uh, there are a lot of uh, girls and women that um, were in situations that uh, they didn't have anywhere to go to, to protect themselves. And as Afghanistan uh, Women Chamber of Commerce, um, the only thing that we have uh, taught to do is the, the training. The training uh, programs when once a lot of women get into Could Facebook. you speak up just like, that's very hard to hear you, sorry. <laughs> yes. Uh, so when our women get into, you know, Facebook pages and when they're set up to use really uh, the Facebook, especially Facebook uh, for their uh, promotion and so on, then uh, they need training to also learn how to keep themselves secure and how to do all the, um, um, those security measures, to take those security measures, measures that are existing in these uh, platforms. Um, my question is, uh, just so, my name is Cynthia Smith, I am a survivor of domestic violence, and I, my question is that um, I don't know nationally or internationally, but I do know that more and more women are losing custody of their children to abusive men. Um, my question is, uh, with surviving and having a voice, I, I want to ask a seat at the table where it matters. We matter as a woman. Um, and 
where are those events? Because I feel as though as in healing, I wanted to have a voice where we are not really, you know, taken seriously or, um, you know, I just feel the need to uh, have a voice for other women who lost custody of their children, um, survival, survivor of domestic violence. But my concern is that I, I don't see that many of us that sit on that table that could really speak up what is really, you know. So I'm so privileged and, and blessed to be here, but I just want your input with regards to if this is an ongoing thing uh, internationally, because nationally, majority, you know, more and more women are losing custody of their children. And when you lose custody of your children, especially you're the, you know, a stay-at-home mom, you lost your power, because your kids are your power. You lost their, your life because that, you know, our kids are our life. You know, we, we think about the future of our children. So in doing so, all I'm so glad being here because I, I might have a lot of connection with regards to, you know, learning what you have mentioned about um, assessing what's, you know, um, what's out there and how do you, it, it just, um, I guess, groundbreaking for me that I could connect with you guys to see where can our voice be because there's not many uh, victims' right uh, policy that have survivors who can actually, you know, include include us to the policy and stuff. But thank you so much for allowing me to speak. Yeah, no, thank you very much for sharing. Um, I think what you mentioned is uh, probably true in every country that often survivors of domestic violence aren't very <coughs> forthcoming and coming out and talking about it. And really the only way it's going to be addressed is by more people sharing their stories. So perhaps in all of your experiences, looking at creating networks and bringing groups of women together, are there more initiatives? Are you finding more initiatives to talk more openly about the frequency of gender-based violence and perhaps uh, providing sort of networks and support systems, as well as economic empowerment, and providing all those sort of networks where you yourself might not be the expert, but how do you get women to maybe be associated with those through the platforms that you're trying to have? I mean, I can only speak for Papua New Guinea, um, but well, I can't speak for the country, but speak for our, my little circle that I work in. In terms of, um, you know, survivors of gender-based violence, and I say that because there is some, it's, you know, that represents intimate partner violence as well as um, rape, uh, you know, um, and sexual violence as well. So, for us, the key about economically empowering, but also just empowering women, so that they become more confident at speaking up, sharing their story, making sure that they le learn how to be better policy change makers uh, and advocates for even if they're not a survivor. So everybody knows someone that has. As I said, 98% it's an astounding, horrendous figure, but that's what it is. So most women in Papua New Guinea, if not all, have had some direct contact with <coughs> being a survivor or knowing somebody. So for us, it's about getting that confidence level to be able to talk up about it make the reports. We recently had some of our laws change in the last five years where it's now, um, you know, applicable where it's a punishable offence for a man to, because previous to that, if it happened in the marital home, it's not, uh, you know, it's not punishable. So for us, we're seeing those changes. It is slow in comparison to the rest of the world. You know, it is considered archaic. We still have um, gender-based violence that is linked to sorcery charges. You know, I think we're one of the only countries in the world that has that. So, <laughs> another, another little issue to go um, So for us, you're suggesting that there isn't enough of a voice. We, we're finding that there is becoming more and more of a voice. Um, and this is by virtue of the fact that they're becoming more empowered. Economically empowering them means that they're not restricted to stay in the family home because of the fact that they're not, not a um, You know, they're having a little bit more pull, so to speak, in their family as well as their community. 
politically in the business space, it's just a, a domino effect. So um, just the sheer fact that there is more and more awareness of it in the media and there are more and more laws that are becoming, if not changed, implemented, adjusted to support and address these issues, we're seeing the changes. It is very slow. We have some of the highest speeds on the planet. So, you know, but, but it's happening. So I recognise what she's saying and, and, and you know, you can speak to any female on the street at P and G and they'd be able to identify with you. Yeah. Um, I would just say um, obviously in the work that we're doing around violence against women in the political sector, everything is built on what has already been happening in the gender based violence sector. And so we are quite cognizant that if we are seeing a woman abused as she votes, that we need to be able to map referral services and connect that victim, be responsible um, for that work and connect that victim to referral services and so forth. And we do um, increasingly because part of this process is women coming forward and testifying to their experience. Because when we first started working on this particular type of violence, nobody believed it was really an issue, and nobody believed it really impacted women that were in politics and leadership positions. And so one of the first things that we did is start collecting testimonies from women who were, again, elected parliamentarians or you know, former ministers, and across the board, um, you can find them. And so those testimonies have been really important, having victims actually share their stories and their ongoing experience with this particular type of violence has been critical to raising awareness. I would just um, say that I think it's important that we, when we're talking about um, gender-based violence, we not only think about sort of women experiencing it and why women experience it, but we think also about why men perpetrate it. And when I think about PNG and you say 98% of women are victims of gender-based violence, you know, I always have to ask myself, well, that means how many of the men are perpetrating it and what is that about? <laughs> I mean, that's like, that's, I, and I think, you know, thinking in terms of male identity and masculine gender norms and why men are perpetrating this violence and what can be done to counter that as well, both in the political sector where it's about power and maintaining power, but also in the home. Um, any of your questions? Oh. Uh, either one of these. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, my question is from uh, Manager John. Uh, very happy to see you after a long time <laughs> and very proud of you. And uh, I have lots of questions, but I'm going to ask only two of them. The first one is, uh, where do you see Afghan women businesses in five or ten years? Considering the fact that most of businesses in Afghanistan, women businesses, are small and medium sized. So, by your support, uh, where do you want to see them in ten years? And the second question, in your pathway through lead to now, how much support did you receive from women in parliament or women in government and high level women in Afghanistan? So uh, how much support did you receive from them? Have you received from them? Okay, um, so I'll start with the first on the how much support we received from the parliament and from the female government um, officials. Um, parliament, um, as I said, the High Economic Council is the highest decision-making platform chaired by the President himself, so when we were going to the High Economic Council, uh, we just didn't have to approach any of the female parliamentarians, and, uh, and right now, too, we're not much into this um, uh, establishing relationship with female parliamentarians because um, soon we'll have the next round of elections for the uh, inshallah yes. <laughs> uh, until end of 2018 hopefully um, uh, parliamentary elections so we don't want to oh uh, yeah I want to be frank we don't want to waste time on creating establishing relationships and then maybe some of those may not come back um, and since we have the, this direct connection of course we want to how we use that. Um, <coughs> and uh, the female government officials, yes, um, I want to highlight that um, since this, this new government, 2014, uh, President Ghani was very much uh, uh, committed to bring a lot of uh, women into high-ranked uh, positions, ministers and deputy ministers, and he did. He brought a lot of them. 
and we are in a very good uh, shape. For example, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Economic Relations, um, she is very supportive. Uh, she ensures that we get into all regional and international uh, platforms when there are uh, meetings about the class and economic issues. And the Deputy Minister of Commerce is a woman. Uh, she makes, makes sure that we get into everything that the Ministry, ministry does, the Ministry of Commerce, which is the main, main and major counterpart for Afghanistan and Chamber of Commerce. Um, and uh, we have a uh, few others who are very supportive. Uh, of, uh, Yes. So, since, uh, they were also new. For example, uh, let me also highlight the Minister of Mines and Petroleum. It's a woman now. We have a woman leading the Ministry of Mines and Petroleum in Afghanistan. And since the majority of them came from non-governmental jobs, so earlier, for example, the Deputy Minister of Commerce, was she was herself uh, a female entrepreneur. She was running uh, a group of companies. Uh, yes, and the Deputy Minister of um, Okay, Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs. She used to work for the government, but of course she was uh, outside the government uh, for a few years, and she was here in the United States. She's worked, and she returned to Afghanistan. So they all have a total different uh, mental mentality and mental set of how to work, and even if you're a government official, but how to work with people. <laughs> Uh, and then the Minister of um, Mines and Petroleum too, she uh, was in the non-governmental sector, she was running her own NGO uh, before coming to the government. So she's, uh, and, and all of them are young, below 40. Um, so really um, they have a different attitude, different energy, and different, uh, um, different set of values for how to work with people and how to serve. That's great. And where uh, where we see um, Afghan women uh, businesses in five to ten years, uh, we really um, we really expect uh, to see um, a majority of them who are in the uh, small size to grow into the medium size, and the ones that are in medium size to grow into a larger uh, businesses. And we are working right now on. Uh, with the Minister of Commerce on a trademark uh, made by Afghan women. And um, attached to that trademark made by Afghan women, we're working on a set of um, standards, uh, international standards, uh, that also should be allowed nationally, of course. So uh, we could um, encourage women to use uh, those standards uh, and use this made by Afghan women uh, trademark for selling within Afghanistan and outside Afghanistan. And we will promote it as the uh, Afghanistan Minister of Commerce and as well as Minister of Commerce and Industry uh, to promote and brand that made by Afghan. That's great. Uh, yeah, so hopefully we'll see a good number of women owned businesses into a different level by the next few years. Yes, and there are access now to contracts, to the government contracts. That's another huge thing because uh, women owned businesses in Afghanistan. They really, um, I mean, one of the major challenge was their uh, their um, constant sales. They were only happy, or their only opportunities were to sell at the exhibitions if they were producing um, goods, and if they had uh, services, they only had the opportunity to go into becoming a third or uh, second or third subcontractor, which is like really you know the least of the the amount remain and they would work with that. Uh, but now we have this uh, leverage to really get them to, to yeah. direct uh, contracts for selling their uh, products and their services. Yes. Very encouraging. Oh, thank you. Hi, I just had a quick question that follows directly from Manisha's comments. Um, congratulations, first of all, on getting the 5% set aside and the government procurement procedure. I was curious, um, does that cover all contracts? Is that just gov Afghan government contracts? Is that um, any business that's done in Afghanistan? And um, you know, we all know that the difficult part after getting a policy passed is the implementation of that policy. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about uh, how the international community can support the implementation of that 5% contract um, set aside. and just remembering from this group of deputy minister, women, young reform leaders that was just here in Washington a couple of weeks ago that Manisha mentioned 
um, a couple of the deputy ministers who participated, one of them commented that there were 700 new contracts that just went out from the government, and I, so I just wondered uh, in the implementation of this new process how that's going to play out and, and where you see that going forward. Thank you. Yes, um, so um, it's uh, the 5% set aside contracts is just for the government uh, contracts. Um, we will have to do a whole uh, set of other work to, to also encourage our international um, international partners and agencies <coughs> and international community to also um, also to give us this kind this kind of yeah. <laughs> uh, that you're here uh, <laughs> advocacy should be happening. Uh, yes, hopefully. Uh, but in terms of implementation, uh, the National Procurement Authority, uh, they have uh, an institute of um, a training institute uh, where we have agreed that uh, we will conduct a set of uh, training, um, both I mean, and class training and hands-on training with our own uh, businesses. So they really learn how to fill out the forms, the and then how to put forward, I mean, do all, all kinds of things, like costing and uh, the, um, the uh, proposals and so on. Uh, and, and, and what, to learn all the tricks, right? yeah. <laughs> to learn all those tricks of, of how, to, how to win um, contracts. Um, and also, um, on the other side, we have to, uh, we have to work with our own businesses to assess them and to guide them through the assessment process that uh, whether they're ready to go for, for government contracts or not. And if they're not, what are all set of um, measures that they have to take for their business to get ready to, to go for those uh, contracts? And um, Megan is the director of um, Afghan American uh, Women's uh, Council. US Afghan Women's Council. Yeah, US Afghan Women's Council. And so we, we are uh, working on um, meeting some people uh, to get this process of um, uh, assessment uh, in place with an American uh, company, uh, Women Owned, and uh, they have this. Uh, this assessment uh, process, they've done it already, and uh, we want to use that. But uh, that needs some, some fundraising too. <laughs> so we're, we'll do that once we get into yes. Mm -hmm. right, we have one more question, and then also if I could ask our panelists to add any last comments or final remarks that they might have. Hi, um, my name is Alexandra Chirau, um, and I work in business development, and I'm also a graduate student at American University. Thank you for being here today. Um, each of you touched on some of the needs of the women in your communities, whether it's um, language or digital skills or um, you know, civic engagement education. And what I'm really curious to know is, well, these are certainly needs of, of your programs and the women in your community. What are some of the assumptions that you constantly see coming up in programs that are maybe not needed and that are sort of the assumptions of women entrepreneurs and the assumptions of women moving from entrepreneurship into political engagement? And how do we pull those assumptions out of our programs and make sure that we're not repeat, repeating education um, and instead growing these women and giving them um, additional education that they need to continue their, their career? Yeah. I'm trying to. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm just trying to get my head around. So you're wanting to work out if there are existing assumptions in the public to, towards our programs that we're carrying out in terms of empowering women to, um, to have them ready to be politically empowered. Is it true? Whether it's your programs or just the programs in um, in your fields in general and in your communities. Yeah. Um, oh look, because I think gender-based violence is the hot topic all the time for PNG, the assumption is always that what's the link? Is it, is it someone else talking about gender-based violence? Um, I don't know about the other programs because um, 
previous to site, my uh, space was in gender-based violence. I, I, I founded and run an NGO that I've had for a couple of years about providing counselling and, and trauma you know, facilities and so on for women up there. But with the site work, we've stayed away from that specifically because we don't we want to remove those assumptions from the market to say it's not always about that. You know, we're trying to improve the economy in general um, by working on women in you know, women in commerce. So that's the general assumption that I get in terms of you know the space that we're in and when we're talking about it, because that's always a question that's there, but how's it going to reduce that? What are you doing towards that? What, you know, how are you working towards that? They, um, it is a culture change that's getting to that point and, and, and now people are, are moving towards that, understanding that, hang on, it's not necessarily always about that. That's not the determining factor that drives women to not perform to the best of their capabilities or, or the main blocker. It's one of the primary ones, but it's not the only one. So um, for us, that tends to be the primary assumption that we have to kind of re-explain and say, no, this is, the, this is going to be the benefit for the entire country economy for these individuals. I hope that answered your question. I'm okay. sure. Oh, <laughs> um, so for us, the assumption is that Afghan women businesses, uh, they need training. Yes, they need training, all kinds of training for the financial literacy for um, how to uh, manage their marketing and do their marketing and um, and then their sales and you know, all kinds of that. But um, uh, the but a lot of trainings took place uh, and um, and nobody uh, thought of really fundamental work to be done with these uh, women, uh, business owners uh, because. Um, in-class training is is good. Yeah, it provides uh, um, it pro provides uh, a set of knowledge uh, for a person. Then um, you need to really also be able to implement that set of knowledge that you gain in, in a training in an in-class training. Um, and that piece is missing in in, in all these years. Um, Unfortunately, our international um, international partners <coughs> have not learned on this. They, they continue doing that. They continue coming with their uh, short-term training program, uh, and um, they continue doing that in-class training and PowerPoint presentations and thinking that okay, but this half an hour or <laughs> half a day uh, training. Uh, and especially with the PowerPoint presentation, uh, they equipped these women with the knowledge and with the skills that uh, they needed to run their businesses successfully. And the other um, issue is the exhibitions. Yes, exhibitions is the, as I said earlier, that is and was the only uh, way to help these women say it. But then um, uh, before that, or I mean, at the same time, when you do the, these exhibitions to give them an opportunity to sell their products, uh, you need to do some other fundamental work with them on their product, product the, its design, its quality, teach them standards, teach them, and connect them with those um, places where they can standardize their product, get, 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 get themselves certified uh, that they need for those products. Uh, unfortunately, now none of those has happened. Only the trainings and the exhibitions have taken place, and the still continues. Okay, yes, we, the assumption is correct. We need training, uh, but not anymore in class training. We need really hands on, long term mentorship and coaching um, and hands on uh, uh, guidance to, to be able to to use that knowledge that we have already learned and to um, implement that and, and, and run our business successfully. <coughs> um, I would just add that uh, very much a reflection of what's been said. For a long time, the support was individual support. So it was very much focused on building capacity and training individual women. 
So from whether it probably is similar in the women in development model versus the gender development model and then the democracy and governance world sort of picked that up and it was women in politics as opposed to gender in politics, which is really burdening the individual women with creating all the change. And uh, one example from elections, I think in Zimbabwe or Zimbabwe or Zambia in like 2012, we trained you know all these women, more than 200 women to run for office and none of them were nominated, and none of them won, and it was really frustrating for them, and it was really sort of an eye-opener for us because it basically illustrated that no matter how strong or capable or confident these women were, it wasn't really ultimately up to them to choose whether or not they were on the political party's list. It wasn't up to them to decide who voted for them. And so our theory of change has expanded out from individual women and now looks to address sociocultural norms and institutional barriers, and we look at it really at three levels. Um, and, and, and trying to say, okay, well, if women are perfectly capacitated, but what are the laws and the rules and the processes that are still discriminating against them? And how can those change? And then, again, back to the norm drivers for um, social norm change, because it can really just be about how the voters perceive them or how the community perceives women in leadership or in public life and so forth. And these are all influenced, obviously, in different contexts by religion um, and other contextually specific. Cool. We had one more, one more question. Okay, one more. Question. I don't want to like <laughs> slide in there, but no, great. Hi, um, I'm Lisa Darling, and I'm coming from the Women's Democracy Network at IRI. Um, so we we work. We're kind of a, a sister institution with NDI. Um, I have so many thoughts uh, coming from this presentation. So thank you all for coming here and, and putting this on. Um, so. You know, we, we work with the Bangladesh Women's Chamber of Commerce and Industry, so a lot of what you're saying is definitely echoing a lot of the, the work that we're trying to do um, with their Chamber of Commerce, um, some issues that they're having, given me lots of ideas for things that we might be able to do as far as workshops and trainings go. Um, so I'd love to connect on that after. But um, so on an Afghan panel of, of women leaders um, at Brookings, there was a lot of this um, this kind of backlash about women having to be women's champions um, and how women that are in these leadership positions. I mean, we, on this panel there was Adela Raz, uh, Mugadessa Gurish, uh, Gizal Hares, uh, Shahrazad Akbar. Um, you know, they, a lot of them were saying that like it's it's really difficult to have to have the expectation of going to the negotiating table always with women's issues. Um, on your mind and that it's it kind of makes it impossible for these women to be successful in these leadership positions um, that oftentimes this the the men on these at this table will put them in these boxes that we're, we're self-interested that we're not interested in promoting um, true equity that we're just here to promote our own issues and to, to get noticed which of course we all know is wrong and we're all looking to empower women for the betterment of you know our societies um, but how do you have any ideas of how we can combat this sort of mentality shared among when, uh, among men and then also being highlighted by these women in power in Afghanistan? Okay. Just more broadly. Um, I think, you know, first of all, when women come into any sort of leadership position elected, especially right because they're making decisions for the community or the country, it is important to understand that not them being in that leadership position alone is a, is a form of empowerment and it's critical and is important. Whether or not they're delivering for the gender equality or the gender just agenda is another sort of assessment or analysis and, and in the democracy and governance world there is really no agreement yet on whether that should be an indicator of you know, full empowerment and so forth. So there's still a little bit of a divide. That being said, I think people should be very cautious of how smart men are. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> because I was recently in Nigeria, just for an example, <coughs> in a local community with women from political parties from all over, different parties up to there was at least six parties. And the conversation started out with women complaining about other women and women getting in women's way, women being the problem. And then the conversation, we had a woman there from Kenya who had been through political processes and sort of you know, really building their awareness. And over two days, they realized that they were very well easily manipulated by the men in leadership to keep them sort of at odds with each other so that they didn't come together across the men. 
So when you when you think about sort of the men complaining about, you know, it, it mimics a lot of what goes on here in terms of the manhood movements versus around education and so forth. Just be very cautious. I think people need to be very aware of when it's a, a true, real complaint. Because in certain situations, you cannot burden one woman. It's like sending women to the peace talks and saying, you will bring all of women's needs into this peace talk, and then it's your fault that they weren't included in the transition process, right? That is a true concern, and the environment that they're operating within has to be enabling. But at the same time, what points are being raised against these women by their male counterparts, and how true are they um, needs to be considered. Great point. Love to hear it from. So, um, um, on this issue, uh, I was in Kabul, there was an event and I was on a panel and one of the smart, uh, smart men, one of the smart men <laughs> <laughs> was, the, was moderating the panel mm -hmm. and he posed this question that, um, so you have now a lot of women in, the, um, in these high rank positions as ministers and as deputy ministers how support the path they live. And, um, and so when women, women are appointed in these um, high rank uh, positions, um, a lot of times also these, uh, you know, using smart men, a lot of these they, 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 their job is done because now there's a, there's a woman minister and or a, or a female deputy minister and so whatever uh, needs to be done for women, they are responsible to, to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, and my response was, uh, well, yeah, it's good. They're, uh, the, the, the minister is a woman or the deputy minister is a woman. Um, but um, we don't have much expectations from them because um, we understand their situation being uh, a minister. I mean, apart from they are a woman, but she's a, a minister or the deputy minister. And her role also has a lot of expectations from her. And on the other side, we have to see how much um, how much political support and how much um, authority she has been given. Because there are times that in our country that women are appointed as ministers and as deputy ministers, but they don't have as much as uh, political support that's required to run that office. And, and if you expect that woman to really bring in a lot of other women in that ministry, uh, I mean, that expectation is, it doesn't match with that level of uh, authority and political support that she needs. And so this was my answer to, the, to that guy then. Um, well, this is how much we expect. If, if they don't get the right, uh, and, and the right amount of political support and uh, authority that they need, to do what they want to do as a woman, for their women, uh, we cannot expect them to do much. Yeah. So that needs to be matched when they are in the political, <coughs> and, and these, these political positions, and we need to see how much political support and uh, the amount of political support and authority that they have got with that position to do yes, all that they want. Um, in, in our, I guess, in our space in the Pacific, we do have the same issues that you've described where a lot of women pull each other down. It's been the age old and you know, um, a lot of the different women's groups we're dealing with. There's a big push, you know, where we have to be consistently pushing our sisters up and so on. But the other thing we're pushing as well is, um, you know, we have a really strong mentorship program that we run out of the centre and we're trying to develop again across the country. And, um, what myself and my staff have been pushing for is not necessarily having women as the mentors you know, and finding those champions of change in our men uh, that are prepared to be the mentors, that are prepared to recognise, you know, I would love to open the newspaper one day and see a woman talking about changes in the tax reforms for business just because she's in that position, not because she's a woman, but just because, you know, people want to hear her opinion and she happens to hold an executive position in that space. So. Um, in terms of a political arena and, you know, is it a case of, and we have the same issues there, is it, you know, some women get to that lower level government, um, uh, you know, platform and they're, they're encouraged to decision run this, you know, women, we're, we're, we're all going to support you. There's a lot of corruption and bribery in our government as well. 
<laughs> Way to make friends and become popular, but anyway. Um, but in saying that, you know, so the women do try, but then sometimes their own family. Yeah, it's good that you're running for these offices, but we don't believe you can do it. So it's about changing that, that whole concept of we want to put you in power, we believe you, that you're going to be able to carry out the, uh, or implement the changes you want to make finding these champions of change and actively putting them in the public eye that, that they want to speak about, not just women's issues, but they want to you know, help empower our women as well. And they're not necessarily the men that are married with eight kids and they want to put all their daughters through private school. It's, you know, just, yeah. So, so we've been spending a lot of time as well making relationships with men in, in parliament, you know, in that political arena, men in business, looking at who our executive board is going to be making sure that they're influential men as well, um, and making sure that the influential women that we involve are not going to be uh, you know, holier than thou, because they've gotten there. But they are still remembering that, yes, you're a spokesperson for women, but you're a spokesperson for PNG as well. Don't necessarily always present the women's issues. You know, that's empowering itself that you get into that position. Um, but keep it a happy medium. It's, it's hard to find that happy medium, but hopefully you can dribble on the you know, and I think finding that happy medium, um, I mean, I think, you know, the Afghan Women's Chamber was established because there's a giant need to have a space for women in business to have their own platform and to, you know, advocate for the issues that are creating barriers for them to start or grow or formalize their business. And I think the end goal is always to have, you know, everyone together I and mean, separate is never equal. And I think we've seen that everywhere. So to have separation means there's still a lot of work to be done. <laughs> um, so I guess, uh, uh, I think, does anyone have any last things to go? No, I think. Okay, let's give a big applause.